Hey, Alicia, Hi. we are so happy to be here having this conversation with you. I have to tell you, you really so impressed me as a young filmmaker. Um, uh, not because you're a young filmmaker, actually, just because you're just a strong filmmaker and you just happen to be young, which means you have a whole lifetime of beautiful work to bring to us. And like, honestly, you know, Kirk did ask us, you know, who would you like to be programmed with or who's a young filmmaker that's upcoming that impressed you? And it was like immediately I was like, Alyssa. So <laughs> she, you were like, she got uh, next. She got next. Yeah. Uh, so, that's so go. sweet. Cause when I think about just like me, I don't know if you remember the first times that I met both of you, but it was like times where like I saw each of you. There were separate occasions and I was like, that's Jen Holmes. That's that's other one. It was like, let's get in line to meet them. And it's yeah, it's just an honor coming from you because I'm sure you both know you've like paved the way for so many young filmmakers like me and I you know with so many things with your work with like battling all the I'm sure annoying like <laughs> barriers which you're still battling and like the creation of the black screen office like I already feel like I'm in a better industry because you two are in it and have been working to give us more space. And it's a shame that it's like a lifetime of work that you're doing to get us there. But I'll just say, I'm really appreciative because um, I can I can feel the shift. And I know it's like, I can't even imagine, like, <laughs> even just with this film, like I can't imagine like how hard it was to just engage uh, people about black stories. <laughs> it's, you're absolutely right. And thank you, thank you for saying this because sometimes you know, one of the, the, the difficulties in doing work in Canada is that you're forced to be in silos. You know, you're forced to work on your own. And so I had Suds with me and he had me and, and we, we, we have this. And I think that's part of the reason why we even are able, even still here, because the mm -hmm. siloing of our work and our voices has been one of the, one of the major challenges. People have erased our history. People have erased our value in this country and here's the thing because it's canada and because it's known to be multicultural people did not acknowledge or recognize the struggles that we were really going through which were real and difficult and so we we um in making home again it was like it was it nearly broke me <laughs> um but you know i am jamaican and i'm a black woman and uh and so it, it takes a lot more than that but it nearly broke me because I had people tell me that you don't need to make a salary on this. If you want to make, uh, if you want more money, um, you know, make a Canadian film. The idea that this was not a Canadian film, even though Canadian, Black Canadians were making it, the director, Canadian born, like all of these things did not make it a Canadian film. Which is something that we kind of faced all our careers, like just saying basically, you're not Canadian. And ultimately, your stories are not Canadian. Your stories are niche. Yes. Your stories mm -hmm. are don't matter enough to the wider audience. Is really what it's what they're saying. So the thing is that we've been fighting this from day one, and we continue to fight it because it's like it does it, it hasn't stopped and it will not stop until we bust the door down. Yeah. So like, thanks for for for, for those kind words. Um, and so in terms of um, as you're, you know, hopefully you won't have the same road. We're trying to break those, you know, we're trying to break those barriers down. And just to some of those who went before us, like Claire, Claire Piedo or Roger Gutierrez, like they also broke down some of those barriers, saying that we are here, we've been here. So it's something that, we, you know, we constantly try to pay it forward, constantly try to like make new opportunities, mentor folks. So this is what we're trying to do. Yeah. Now I have a question for you. I mean, you made such a wonderful uh, short film. What's wonderful about it, it's visual, it's poignant, and it's also in a very short period of time, you express so much. Um, how did you discover that film language, you know, like that, 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 um, yeah, the, the, the language you use, what, what, what inspired you and how did the story come together? Wow. Oh. Thank you for the compliments. Um, yeah, I, I, I started off 
uh, well, I went to film school and in film school, I directed and I did production design. And I think one thing that I am always thinking about when I'm crafting even the script stage is how can I use all of the tools to better serve the point? And for me, the point of the story was to get people to empathize with this character and, you know, empathize with a, a young black girl's experience of her hair, which to me, it seems very niche and specific, but everything is universal and all <laughs> feelings are universal. And that's why it's so frustrating that we have to convince people that the feelings that are being expressed in the story are things anyone can relate to if they just have the power to empathize. And we've been relating to like white stories since the beginning of time. Yep. Anyway, so I just wanted people to empathize with the character and I decided, you know, the main stylistic choice I made was not to show her face um, because I just wanted to force the viewer to think about how she was feeling um, and that I worked with my cinematographer to just create a cinematic visual language that would be still interesting for us to watch, um, but also just not giving the viewer the satisfaction of seeing her, her reactions. And then I, I always like to think about the colors and the spaces and I tried to make the spaces that were more threatening to her like look that way just by choosing threat colors that are, you know, a bit more aggressive. And I wanted the film to be very set in Canada. So the whole film, there's like <laughs> Canadian stuff in the background because kind of what we were talking about before, Canada is not a utopia. And one of the problems is that we don't recognize how we're racist. We don't recognize a racist <laughs> history. And then there's no changes. And people could, like the amount of people that just watch my film, which is, I don't even like the word microaggressions, but you know, is showing a series of microaggressions and people were like, oh, like I didn't even notice I was doing this or I didn't notice that like these comments were inappropriate. And it's just because we have really outward racism here too, but there's also just these little things that Canadians I think are really good at and not recognizing that like it's coming from a not a great place. And yeah, I mean, I just wanted the film to be something that would make young black women and black women and black people feel seen and like this is a, an experience that most of us have had and being othered and then just have other people learn from the movie and i think all of the choices i made in the visuals were connected to that idea mm -hmm. which is so like i said so really beautifully done and um and and just really impressed us but it's it's such an interesting thing because I, I feel like in some ways you got the film done. I say, um, you know, like you know, in, uh, we talked about Jesus and before, uh, after death, <laughs> you know, um, and you know, AD and um, I guess before, um, and I feel like something happened in Canada, like like two years ago, a year and a half ago, when when George Floyd was murdered, and on the the the, the back of his murder this crazy thing happened in Canada and there was a recognition of um, the racism <laughs> that was always there, the structural and systemic and the, you know, the overt and the, and the microaggressions and all this stuff that has actually really had an impact in our ability to make work and be successful. And so I think in many ways, I commend you even greater because you got the film done <laughs> before death. <laughs> I mean, it's horrible. I mean, but yeah. this is how I think about it, right? Yeah. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? And so what was that journey for you a little bit, trying to get that film made at a time when there was a little bit of a shift because there was a gender thing, but no one recognized uh, intersectionality? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I think actually what was just the hardest part, even beyond like getting funding, because like we crowdfunded, we did garage sales, we did arts council grants. So like the money came from a lot of different places. Um, and we, it was like my first big film outside of film school. So we were just very motivated to get the money. Um, but what was just the most isolating was like saying the log line to people and just being like, if I would say it to a white person in the industry, cause you know, people are always asking what you're doing. I would be like, uh, well, it's about a girl who wears her Afro to school and like there's this history about like even from slavery times like I'd be like really justifying the film because people just would be like, 
okay, so is it a comedy? <laughs> like, What's it really know? about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I would just like be ex- over explaining and then I would just like tell a black person they're like, oh, okay, we know what this is about. <laughs> so I think that was actually the hardest part was I just felt so isolated in like being in predominantly white circles and just kind of trying to make, like almost justifying it to myself why I was even telling the story and like, who's going to care? Um, and then... I made it and I'm like, okay, people care. (laughs) But I think it was actually just more difficult in just like being in rooms and proving that it was a story that needed to be told, even just a short, even like a young black girl, like it was important. Um, And even if the only person that it like touched or inspired was like the young actress that I worked with who like is now like such a big spokesperson for like everything. Um, I love that generation. Um, Like I would have felt like I did my job, but I know it's a film that's like touched a lot of people and like I'm getting it into schools, um, which was always a part of my plan. So yeah, I'm just really proud of the process. Um, But enough about me, speaking of the process. (laughs) With Home Again, what's, what's the origin story there? And what I'll say, what I really like about the film is like you rarely get to see like, Jamaica in like an honest light that's not just like tourism everybody like like I think Cool Run Cool Runnings is a cute movie but it's a lot of like stereotypes and I guess like how where was the origin of the story and like was it important to just like have a different view of Jamaica because I would say like I don't think we even to this day still just have like honest stories um that show just like a real Jamaican life. Um, and I'm also Jamaican, <laughs> which is why I- <laughs> Yacht, Yacht, he's in the house. Yeah, Spanish town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you want to answer first or, or do you want to go first? You go first. Okay, well, right, you know, I'm just checking. Um, all right, so here's the thing. So I am actually Jamaican born and I came to Canada when I was about five, six-ish. And um, so when I, when I, but I did all my schooling here from grade one on up. And when I was in, uh, I think grade school, I met a young man who later on um, was deported in his twenties. And, um, and so I remember reading about him, Suds and I read, read about him. I read about him, I said, Suds, oh my God. And I was like, how could they deport this guy? He came to Canada when he was a baby, like 17 months old or something, you know? And so I started looking into it. And the NFB approached us because we had done a film called Secrets for the Dead that they really liked. They approached us to do this thing called alternative drama. So what it was that you would take a, doc, a traditionally documentary story matter, and then you would actually, um, you would dramatize it in some way, right? And so off the sex, success of, you know, I think like guns and a few other things, they were like, we think you guys would be great for this hybrid situation. So we were very excited about this. We went down to Jamaica. We interviewed over 40 deportees. We actually got permission to go into their, you know, to the districts and stuff in Kingston. We wanted to get this right. You said something about authenticity and honesty. I feel like most of my, my career, I've been trying to make work that felt honest and was really based on our true experiences and not necessarily the experiences that people would like the pretty experiences or just the the nice experiences or the the fake experiences that that you know or you know or trauma in a way that white people love trauma right but what are the actual real things that are happening in to us or you know around us by us all of these kinds of things so that was super important to to me and i'll turn it over to suds so he can talk about what his 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 vibe on all this. Um, the truth, yeah. Oops, um, sorry. <laughs> so when we talk about authenticity, that's our aim. So whether it be a comedy, whether it be a drama, whether it be a documentary, we're trying to go for authentic our authentic selves as black folks. And so we went down to Jamaica, went to places like Greenwich Farm, went to places like Tivoli, got permission from the local dons to actually go and enter because you have to go get permission from the local dons to go into these places. They call them area leaders, they don't call them dons. So we went to the area leaders and actually got permission. And we had to come correct. And we had to come with respect and of course pay a little bit of money. So we went there and actually asked people who were deported what their lives were like. We filmed them, we, we gave them a little bit of cash because these people are living on the streets. And so they're living like rough, you know? 
up. So it's the thing is, is that we wanted to come correct and say, what is your story? How did you, and, and you would hear the Scarborough in their voices. You hear the Brixton in their voices. You hear the Kentucky in their voices because these people were not Jamaican. They were maybe Jamaican when they were born, but they hadn't seen Jamaica, don't know Jamaica. And so we, they also trusted us because we went to people who were like standing in line begging at, at, the, at the ATM. And it was like, oh, wait a second. They couldn't even get a bank account because they were yeah. born national. So the thing is, is that we approached them on, on the real, just had real talk. And then from that began to devise the script. Yeah. And so from there, as we're devising the script, we're, we're continually trying to get closer to the truth, closer to the truth as these as, as people felt it, because we wanted to stay honest and true and try to tell the story of these folks at once they hit the ground in Jamaica. And it, it's like, it, it can be a death sentence. And that's something that is not stopped because it's not like there's all these resources for people to come down because also they're shunned from family. They're seen as a disgrace. You, you mess up yourself, you mess up your life. And also they don't know a lot of people in Jamaica. So it's hard. It's very hard. And it's not just Jamaica, these things are happening. It's happening all over the world. This is Vietnam. This is, this is Nigeria. It's all over the place. So we wanted to cause, call attention to that. And we also wanted to say for people, get your citizenship, get your kids to have their citizenship because they could be deported for anything that's a crime that's greater than six months. Oh, that's yeah. one of the things, that was one of the options that we try to do because we also, it's also an advocacy piece too. We try to tell people, get deported because you shouldn't have to pay English. for a teenage mistake. Get, get, yes, get deported. <laughs> don't get deported. Don't, don't get, deported. get deported. Get your citizenship <laughs> so that you don't get deported right. because you don't, you shouldn't have to pay for yeah. a, a crime that you do when you're 16 years old that other mm -hmm. kids here get a slap on the wrist. You shouldn't have to pay for it with your life. And yeah. that was the whole point. I mean, like, look, marijuana, it's, all, it's interesting to me. So two things, just, just two more things about this. Um, part of the story as well was the fact that all these governments, Canada including, were changing their laws to make it easier to deport. So this was number one. And people weren't aware of this. And so we wanted this to be a cautionary tale as well. Because when, and you know, you see it now, right? When, so when you have like all these international governments changing laws right you have to you have to highlight it and and then the second thing is that you know um it's like um people don't realize how vulnerable they are in the system and sometimes parents don't even tell them or don't even think it's important you know they want sometimes they think they want to have this dual thing and let me tell you that it was no, it's, it's not dual they don't want to give up their jamaican yeah. citizenship and the thing is that it doesn't make you any less Jamaican by having a Canadian citizenship or having dual citizenship because Jamaica tolerates dual citizenship like all the Caribbean islands. So the thing is, is that not knowing how to navigate the systems here penalizes us, it penalizes our children so that we're ne never able to gain a foothold and to actually increase the amount of wealth generationally. So there's a lot of stuff that we want to talk about in terms of our filmmaking, in terms of our advocacy work, in terms of all of that. But we want to have say that if we are going to build a black community here in this country, we need to build upon successive generations. And so we have to know, know how to navigate the education system. We have to know how to navigate the financial system. We have to know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is something that we are trying to do. And, and hopefully uh, with, with Home, Home Again and films like it and also whatever else, other work that we're trying to do. And hopefully, you know, other filmmakers like yourself, you know, again, like you're, 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 we're trying to do something and build stories of our authentic selves as, you know, with your character, as she's going through her sort of evolution in terms of her understanding of herself through her hair. Um, and, we, you know, seeing a world that says, well, that's something wrong with our natural hair, which is insane, which is like purely insane. So, but the thing is, is that as we're trying to build these visions and share these visions across the country and, and across the world, um, we're trying to say with our authentic selves that we are, yes, we are enough and we are great and we are powerful and we are beautiful, all these things. Yeah, yeah so, I love that. And I, I think that's- lucky <laughs> Oh, I was just gonna say that I think that we're definitely aligned in that mission, I feel like like what you were saying before, Jen, like everybody wants to see like the trauma in, in a way for the white gaze. And like, can we just all have the freedom to just share like, yes, our pain, but our joy and just like 
can all, I just want to get to a point where every black filmmaker can just tell whatever story they want and people won't be like, we already have this or- This one, yes. We, yeah, right, yeah, this one, <laughs> one, so now nobody can do it. And it's like, do you know how many white love stories we have? Like, can we no. all just, I want to see a million stories about joy. I want to see a million biopics of the same person. Like, you know, <laughs> like there's so, I just want to see us have the same freedom to represent ourselves in the way that we all want to and- not have to justify who's going to watch it or what's the demographic or what are the metrics or how's it going to sell like you know our stories are just about real people with real human emotions and real feelings and anybody can relate and of course we can relate to our own stories but sure. you know I'm just I'm looking forward to that future and I feel like it's coming but we're not quite there yet but we're with every story that we tell and every no. we can push yeah. forward in the time and just getting us closer there. Absolutely. And it's like I said, it's, it's really encouraging to see young filmmakers come up doing this work because, you know, the system has historically stopped us. You know, it's like I said, one or two gets through and you work your ass off just trying to, you know, hire people and bring people in and not having the, you know, the amount of resources. You know, it was really interesting you talked to me about how you, you, you did all these different methods to get funding for this film. Why? I mean, we have a system that is supposed to, you're supposed to go through, you know, the, the, the funding places and your film should have been fully funded through those sources. I mean, it's great that you got it done in these various methods, but it shouldn't have a lot of filmmakers with this kind of clarity of vision that you have they roll up into two little places and they get the full funding and so forth and whatnot you know what i'm saying Spe especially because our voices have not been supported historically right so there should have been like open arms right you know um and and so i think that though um you know you you mentioned i think that i that i had helped to start the black screen office which is true and you know, help to create that because we, we were just realizing how little power we had in the system and having no organization to advocate for us so that, you know, that there are all these means that will actually help you focus on filmmaking, focus on your ideas versus, you know, spending years trying to find this, that, this, that. And then it's so cumbersome because I mean, I'm, your, your, your crowdfunding work, but sometimes people end up with so much people that they have to follow up with and all this kind of stuff. You know, you don't get to then concentrate on the next set of creatives and all these kinds of things. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a real thing to try to tell powerful stories with nuance and vision and that is that is from your own either experience or your community your understanding of your community's experiences um but it's so important it's so important um to have this thing of us making these kinds of stories and being supported in this process mm -hmm. amen <laughs> absolutely so now did you have any other questions oh i should say uh, for those who are watching this thing so one of the proudest things about home again for me is that if you look at our cast um you know we have the wonderful Larry bent of course who plays dunstan in in the film and um but and of course we have um we have the Tatiana, Tati, Ali, Tatiana Ali, Fresh Prince Bel -Air, Bel -Air, and Richard Chevalo, CCH Pounder. But um, one of those people um, you wouldn't have seen in a feature film until this one, because it was his first feature film role, and it was Stefan James. And um, I remember when I met Stefan, and I just, you know, the Everton character was, it was such a, you know, I, I, you know, for me, a bit of the heart of the film and his, his story um and you know a young a young he's british in the film a young british kid who you know went to private school and thought he was just like everybody else until uh, a, a little incident with marijuana which is now of course legal and all people that were arresting people for marijuana is now selling it <laughs> all the <laughs> chips and 
and and so forth and superintendents got into the marijuana business but his story is that he gets deported and um stefan was um had done television but he hadn't done any features and this role which he did so brilliantly it was nominated for canadian academy or i guess, I guess a um, screen, award. screen awards um he was nominated for that but in addition to being so brilliant in it um the film was seen by ava DuVernay, and um and so uh one of the, she apparently saw him and when she was doing selma she said she, that that well, was how he got that part ava wanted to just ava wanted to distribute wow. uh yes. home again actually we were on a, on a phone conversation with her and she was like that that young man stephon james house how's he to work with and we we're like honestly the kid is like so on point so focused and again he was there on his own he was 17 years old he, uh, he's not supposed to be in the say that. He's not supposed to say that, but he was there. We didn't know. We he didn't, didn't tell know. us. We didn't know. So his mama came and said, oh, no, he's, he's legal. Yeah, so, and we're like, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. bring him down to so, Trinidad. And <laughs> so he was there. He was there filming with us for um, well, six weeks. Yeah. And so he was so focused. And this guy, kids have been ramping and running around. This, you know, the, the it, it was yard, carnival. Whatever. It was carnival. All kind of stuff. He could have been crazy. I mean, we went to our Sarah Fetz, but I, like this guy is so serious, so focused. I mean, they, he was rolling around in the dirt, you know, when he was portraying uh, a character at a certain stage. Everton. This, yeah. this, this young man we thought was poised for greatness. Um, we always believed in him and and his brother as well. Uh, and so we um, were very happy to have been his first feature film. Yes. After that, that got of, Ava's attention. Because, yeah. of course and here's now the, here's look at the, him you know I, exactly right and here's the thing what was interesting was that ava wanted to distribute our film and because we had a deal with one of the canadian distributors we weren't they said no and you know when we did love sex and you the bones um it was the same thing we were with the canadian distributor and we actually won the american black film festival award for best feature and we, uh, this is well back in the day, girl. And um, so they had Blockbuster. So we actually got a Blockbuster deal. They were going to put the film in Blockbusters all over the whole world. And our Canadian distributor said no, right? And oh yeah, oh yeah. <sighs> so it's like, so these are the ways that, you know, we sometimes get screwed, you know, and trying to make the work. But the good thing was that this was really terrific and, and, and great for, for, for Stefan. And even for Lyric, he got, um, he was in Acrimony, which was Tyler Perry's feature with uh, Taraj and P. And um, apparently um, his agent told me that Tyler said when he saw him as Dunstan in our movie, he knew he was the guy for that role. So to make work that people can see and that could help shift careers, can help change the narrative for other folks um, is something that you have the power to do, something that we have through our work, you know, help to do. And it's a really amazing, powerful thing. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, and what I'll just say to that is like, I would love to look up how many Canadian films in 2012 had a uh, black cast because if you, you know, no, but do you know, like, it's know. like you're giving people that. So I'll give you an answer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's like wild to think this is just why we need the Canadian industry to catch up because, you know, it like you can say like that was Stefan's first film. And if you didn't give him that role, he probably would have went to the States. He probably would have kept trying to like get stuff here and not got anything because nobody was casting any black leads and you know I know in my film that was her first film this young girl with a huge fro like people are still getting used to like I don't know just black stories and black storytellers telling them and how we want to and it's just yeah it's just inspiring to know that you know your work has like built somebody who honestly otherwise might not have had that opportunity in Canada and in Canada. that's why he, he, yeah. yeah in Canada but, but he's so talented ta but talent, in Canada talent, talent has a way of rising to the top, top and yeah. it's like mm -hmm. you know I don't know how long you're going to be here for hopefully you'll be here doing films in Canada and the states um, because we think you're very very talented and you like there are no borders uh, and I'm sure you've been pursuing uh, opportunities down there as well 
but it's something that we want to be able to make films. And again, we work on other both sides of the board, but like we want to make be able to tell these Canadian stories. We want to be able to tell these stories in our own backyard. Uh, and we it's important for everybody to support any anytime you see uh, films by black storyteller, we support it. Tell your friends, put it on your social media because it's only through that is that we build everybody up, all boats, lift all boats as we rise, you know? So that's the whole thing. So just don't keep it a secret. Like just shout it out and spread it out and share it. Yeah, yeah. someone told me many years ago, vote with your dollars. And if you are supporting black talent and if you are black talent or black folk supporting black talent, vote with your dollars. And if you are an ally, vote with your dollars. Uh, you know, I've heard so many things about allyship, like show us by voting with your dollars. And en Agreed. enjoy the movie. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, enjoy the flims. The flims, the flims, as Jamaican. The, the flims and the, and the tree, no, is it? Oh, the number three, tree. You know, oh, it's gosh. not tree, it's two films, not tree. <laughs> so we're terrible with the Jamaican oh, accents boy. because, you know, it's been a while. Oh my gosh. That's all good. Well, what a lovely chat. What a Her's lovely laughing. chat. 